This is the House of Hockey podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Hockey is more than a game, it's a lifestyle. It's you, the diehard supportive fans, your favorite players who are on the team you cheer for and the organization who supports them. The companies that make your gear, bags, and beer league sweaters, the hockey moms and hockey dads, and everything else that makes this House of Hockey your home. Come on in, I'm Breezy. And I'm Ray Ray. And And this this is is our house. house. Two of the sport's most respected fighters step back into the octagon this weekend to compete for the welterweight title. DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of UFC, is giving you a shot at a huge cash prize for this weekend's fight. DraftKings is offering new players a shot at a million, or sorry, millions of dollars in total prizes. So if you haven't heard it yet, fantasy MMA is easy to play. Just pick six fighters, stay under the salary cap, and pile up points for advances, takedowns, and more. There's no better way to put your MMA knowledge to the test than to compete for a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Plus, don't forget about basketball and hockey, where DraftKings has even more money up for grabs this weekend. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code THPN, that's THPN for the Hockey Podcast Network, to get a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes throughout the weekend. This promo code THPN, again, THPN for the Hockey Podcast Network, to get a shot at millions of dollars in total prizes only at DraftKings.com. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. And there we have it. And yeah. we're now into episode 48, and we are super excited to have our guest, Sean Sidlowski. He plays for the Fort Wayne Commons. He's going to be up here in a little bit. And uh, let's just take a second to rewind on this DraftKings thing real quick. Yeah. Yeah, Breezy. Do and don't forget to introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not, that, not that people don't know who we are, but I feel like we have to do it in Embry, right? <laughs> yeah. And we are your host of the House of Hockey podcast. And again, yeah. this is episode 48. I downloaded the DraftKings for the Super Bowl that happened this past uh-huh. weekend. Yeah. Um, we're recording this ahead of the Super Bowl. So I have no idea if my predictions are right to win that $55 million. But um, even if I did win, I don't think I would tell you all. <laughs> <laughs> God. Well, like if I won $55 million, like I definitely played the money game of like, okay, first you owe taxes. So you like lose half of it. Right. Next, I would like buy myself a house i would take care of the important people in my life with their homes um, that matter to them and then i would go on a vacation to an island for like a month and like take no phone no nothing and just completely disconnect stay at like one of those huts on the beach where like your hut is like on the water. I would order room service every night and I wouldn't care. Like I would order whatever I felt like, like no concern for price. Like what is that life like? That's what I, I want to do. And then That's I would like good. invest the money so that I yeah. I would tell an investor like, listen, I don't ever want to worry about money ever again. So put this where I never have to worry about it and my family never has to worry about money. And then like, I'd figure out a charity to help out as well. What would you do? pretty good. Uh, What would you do with $55 million? Again, I would be like, okay, well, I don't really get $55 million to the taxes, but I would definitely invest a lot of it. I'd take care of, you know, like what you would do. You're immediately, you're immediately, I can't even talk today. What's wrong with me? It's okay. Immediate family Mm -hmm. and i put some money aside for some college funds for my nephews because that's Mm. important uh even though i didn't go to college so they had to make better decisions than i did um and then i don't know i'd probably get a couple vacation houses but i'd always i would make sure i had stuff in the bank 
investment wise and maybe buys things like if i were to get like a vacation house i had airbnb it out so i would still make money off of it so oh yeah of course we're not right like we're not dumb no we may be bad but we're not dumb (laughs) We may be bad, but we ain't dumb. (laughs) Exactly. Got to keep making that money. Yeah, I don't think I would ever just like go, okay, like, and just hard stop and knowing that you had all that money. I mean, no. And it's, it's one of those things too, where it's like, I mean, I've always wanted a Range Rover, but like, I don't need a Range Rover. I have a freaking Jeep. Like, I'm good. Like, I don't need expensive stuff. I would just like to have like a house, like wherever I wanted to have a house. Yeah. Or a condo. Whatever. Yeah, and like that stability, and then you would need like a car for that vacation house that you would just leave right. there. Exactly. So you could pick whatever you wanted, or you could like could. leave the jeep there, and then you could get yourself a range. I could. See, there's really so many could. options. Like there's so many options. <laughs> can you have the freedom? And then you're like, dang, I really need to win that 55 mil so I can make all these <laughs> options come to life. <laughs> Right. But like, here's some here, we're going to go down a weird road, but let's talk about money mindset for a second. Yeah, if you can't envision or believe that you are worthy of a $55 million price or like a 55 prize, I mean, yeah, then you aren't going to win that you are not going to attract that money to your life unless no. you play this game like we just did of like, how would you spend the money? How would you feel if you had it? Because like, if you have negative thoughts about money, you ain't going mm-hmm. to attract that prize. That's true. And that goes for like just all the money, not necessarily yeah. with this contest. Well, it's also funny too, because we've been playing the lotto a little bit because I'm like, wow, that's, that's right. a lot of money. But then I'm trying to have like a different look on it because I was one of those suckers. I have some investments in on the Robin hood app and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, well this sucks. It's like, I can't get it out right now. And I was like, but you know what? That's okay. Because maybe my small donation of what's locked in my Robin hood app is going to turn around and like have me win the lotto or something. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. everyone is worth it. Everyone is worth $55 million. Actually, that's not true. There are people that I would, <laughs> that I could say are not good yeah. people and shouldn't have $55 million. <laughs> or that would be really stupid with that $55 million. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Eh, Anywho. But that's what we would do. Speaking of taking a gamble on things, uh, the NHL season is a freaking the whole thing is a gamble for christ's yeah. sake because of covid19 along with all the other sports mm-hmm. uh as far as like the how they're going to do on the ice situation because this past week there was a slew of teams i love saying silly cheesy words like that there was a <laughs> slew of teams who had covid19 uh tick upticks in their players and staff and a lot more games had to be postponed and rescheduled mm-hmm. and things like that so the nhl decided to make some changes to their covid protocols nothing that i really thought was like detrimental to the players or playing um they're removing some of the glass behind the coaches bench like behind the benches because um they want to have more airflow as opposed to having like the glass all around you and like you're breathing Mm -hmm. heavy and the air can't circulate so that one um like really made sense to me especially because there's no fans in the arena and then they changed how soon people can uh, or how early the team can arrive into the arena they're trying to limit the time where they're like all hanging out together but here's one that doesn't make any fucking sense they want to have six feet of space between the players in the locker room this makes like i this just makes no sense to me because it's well, like, they already have plexiglass separating their like little stalls like what you do at restaurants And it makes no sense because like, for instance, I went out to a restaurant the other day because it just opened up our stay at home orders, whatever, were kind of like lifted for the most part. So restaurants are open. So I was like, sick, let's go out and like eat and support like a restaurant. So you walked inside the restaurant and they have you sitting on like the outskirts 
Mm -hmm. but they have plexiglass in between you but they don't clean the plexiglass in between and like people are going up and like touching it and like whatever and it's like how does this help it doesn't it doesn't it's just it just makes people feel like it does but it doesn't yeah. because here's the thing you're all breathing the air yes like because you're you have your mask off at the restaurant right. once you get yeah. seated at the table so explain to me why you have to wear a mask walking through but your right. germs seated at the table like we're not scientists here we're not or... here to debate covid but none of this makes sense like no the the players are sitting this close to each other on the bench yeah uh-huh the, their exposure rate is higher sitting next to each other on the bench and playing an opposing team than it is in their own fucking locker room yeah. sitting next to each other. They're not like making out and like breathing all over each other. That no, makes but that's like silly. Too, it's a waste. You're like spitting on the ice and stuff yeah. like that. And people are falling on the ice and like their saliva is like getting all over other people. I'm sure it's not that extreme, but like <laughs> They're still spinning on the ice and spinning down on yeah. the bench and this and that. It's like, it's kind of, you're going to, you're exposed at all times, but as long as the players are, you know, doing what they need to do outside of the locker room, outside of the game, then it shouldn't be that big of an issue. Exactly. If See, you're going to let them play, then let them play. Right. It's a gamble. Like I said, yeah. you're taking a huge risk regardless. Like yeah. you're gambling that the players are... And the coaches and the, and the staff are following yeah. the protocols outside of the arenas. You're taking the gamble that the all the arena staff that are still there mm -hmm. are following protocols and that, like, people are washing their hands. I mean, uh, it's yeah. like, pfft, this is just... Everyone, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. I it do was... want to say yeah. one more thing here about these stupid restaurants, because I'm really triggered. This is like my shut the front door. Shut the front door. <laughs> why is it okay for people to go to a restaurant with outdoor dining when the outdoor dining is in an enclosed like plastic <laughs> tent yes are you kidding me yes. you're inside at that point in a plastic dome that's like hot air with even less air circulation than with inside with air like circulation an actual hvac system and you're closer and you're closer it's just ridiculous. I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's totally safe. I'm going to go to the egg house because I can sit outside in a plastic dome. Right. With like eggs. the servers who are not washing their hands every time they touch a plate that's been touched right. by a chef who's yeah. like. Who's wearing a, a face shield and a mask, <laughs> but no rubber gloves. And then they like push the face shield up. So how's your day going today? It's like. Right. Uh, like, not what are good, you doing? Because I'm in a bubble. Shield <laughs> your, down. Shield, shield down. <laughs> Come on, Boba Fett. Cover that face up. Jesus. Oh, my gosh. I but mean. very happy that these people are able to go to work because that is important. But I just think it's really funny how you can sit outside under a plastic dome and that is totally safe because you're technically outside, but you're not. <laughs> Do what yeah. works for you. Mm -hmm. You just be a good person, watch some hockey, cheer for your team, talk a little chirp and shit, and like that's it. Right? Yeah. Like what mm -hmm. more could we ask for? Exactly. Oh, you exactly. know what we could ask for? Fifty five million, <laughs> million dollars. Kings. <laughs> oh my gosh. Too good. I was picking up what you were putting down. Mm -hmm. I got you. And you know what else we didn't ask for, but we didn't know we needed? Huh. Sidney Crosby doing a Michigan on the backhand. <laughs> what? We didn't know we needed that, but we fucking needed that. And we, we love Sidney Crosby here on the House of Hockey podcast, as you all know. And uh, he freaking pulled off the Michigan because, of course, like, of course, didn't mm -hmm. expect any less. But to do it on the backhand and like, just got to love it. You got to love it. Come on. <sighs> What a guy. You don't love it? You don't love it. You're like, ugh. Me? Yeah. Or do you no, like I'm just I, I'm just sitting here in, in all of his glory, just <laughs> sucking it up. <laughs> I mean I'm I'm not like for all those like crazy trick shots that a lot of those like Instagram or TikTok follow like yeah. people do where they do all that crazy stuff with stick handling, which it's very cool. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. And I and I 
am I'm nowhere near that level of skill with with mm-hmm. that. But it's kind of like juggling. It's like, well, why are you doing that? Like, cool, you can juggle and you can juggle knives and you can juggle fire and you can do yeah. this thing with the stick and a puck. But like that serves no real purpose on the ice for the way the right. game is currently played. The Michigan is like the one that skirts that line of like, ooh, we added a little bit of oh magic Sounds. to the game today. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> ooh, look at that magical juggling trick you just did. <laughs> it's like, ooh la la, that was exciting. But like, okay, we're not enough of that. Now just like yeah. punch somebody in the face, please. Thanks. Yeah. Speaking of punching in the face, our guest. Yes. He loves to get a good old punch in the face not him personally he says that hurts and i would assume it would hurt but he likes to punch other people (laughs) yes he does um oh we totally buried the lead here um sean talks about playing with ryan o'reilly growing up and and rr's brother Mm -hmm. and his dad and training with them in the summers and how he just like didn't necessarily love it right he was like, kind right. of, that was the vibe, right? Like, not that he didn't love ROR, yeah. it's just the, like, commitment. He loved, he loved it, but he hated the work that went with it. Because Ryan yeah. just performs at a crazy level and is so competitive with his brother. Mm-hmm. And Sean basically had no chance against the <laughs> two of them. And he knew it. And But he still sucked it up and he went and did it still. Well, yeah, and it paid off because he's playing hockey today uh, with the Fort Wayne Comets in Indiana and has played all over. He's played in, where in, in, where did we say? Norway. Norway. No, he played in Norway for a bit. Um, He's played, yeah, he's, he's been around. He gives us a little bit of a breakdown on everywhere he's played and uh, his experiences and whatnot. And he definitely talks about Ryan O'Reilly. He gave him somewhat of a nickname, I guess, with his abs. Uh, so that was pretty funny. But yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we talked about abs. Any Anytime we could talk about abs in an interview is always a good interview. <laughs> and, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll really like this conversation uh, with Sid um, Sidlowski. That's his nickname, Sid. Breezy's a barbecue kit. Barbecue pit today. We are gonna do a little bit of a Mexican fiesta. So I'm gonna make some Olé. party asada tacos. <laughs> yeah, ole, ole. But I didn't get any margarita mix, and I'm really disappointed in myself. Well, you don't need margarita mix. I know, but you just I don't need have like lemonade, lime, uh, triple tequila. sec tequila. I have all of that actually. I guess there I could go. make my own. You could. But that's so, okay. So carne asada tacos with what else? Just just that's pretty meat much it. And flour tortillas. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Well, I don't eat tortillas because I don't eat tortillas. So I'm gonna put it over some lettuce, make some salad. But tomorrow, as you mentioned, we are recording this prior to the Super Bowl. Tomorrow's the Super Bowl. So we're gonna go all out and just have a day full of snacking tomorrow. So yes. Uh, my favorite thing to make is chicken wings, but I have no chicken wings. So I'm going to do chicken drumsticks. <laughs> Got to make it work. Chicken, yeah. Drumsticks some tri-tip. I don't know. We'll see what else ends up. Maybe more bacon wrapped Oreos. I don't know. We'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. What I'm mostly intrigued about this Super Bowl <laughs> is I want to know what's going on with the weekend's face. Uh, I got totally caught up in the celebrity gossip. So the weekend for you all listening is a musician, a mm-hmm. singer. I don't know that he's a rapper. He's a singer. He's going to be doing the halftime show, yeah. the Super Bowl halftime show. And he, there's photos of him with a face that looks like he had some really bad plastic surgery. He did a music video where his face was all wrapped up in gauze as if he had had plastic surgery, but he said that it was like had to do with the song. And mm-hmm. Then the ad that they are airing on television promoting him performing at the Super Bowl, he looks totally normal and his face looks like it used to look. Yeah. So either they did some CGI shit on his face <laughs> in that video 
or it's all just some kind of like weird artist expression thing. I yeah. want to know what his face looks like. And I well, that's I think what I care about. <laughs> he's playing a character with his new album. So it like he has to do this when he won, I think it was the MTV awards. He came with a wrapped up face because he was like getting into releasing his album. Mm. So he had like had all that and then he came out with that, but he does look normal, but it looks too good to be fake. Okay. But it is the, but it is, I, I don't know. I really don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm That's pretty what... sure he's, I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's normal, but I think with his new album, he may have, maybe he wears like a mask that makes him look like that. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm very, that's what I'm concerned about. And I'm not like as excited as I was last year to watch JLo and Shakira just totally dominate. And like, I was like dancing around the TV. It was like getting me all excited. Like now I'm just going to be like, what does his face look like? You know? You know what my favorite part about the Super Bowl is? What? Snacks and having beer. I don't even watch the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the commercials, like, don't really do it for me anymore. Like, they got pre-released them now anyway, that it's kind yeah. of like the surprise effect is gone. That was part of the fun. I I'm yeah. sure some of them are surprised, but, uh, like, that was what made it exciting. And then when they started pre-releasing the commercials, it was like... Yeah. Well, I've already seen it now, so right. I don't need to watch the game. Exactly. Well, I, mean, I don't really watch the game anyway, and that's totally fun. And now I just get to be excited for food and beer and yeah. seeing if we just won $55 million. I don't know. Hell yeah. <laughs> and if we do, you ain't going to know about it because I'm not going <laughs> to tell anybody. <laughs> or you may kind of get the picture when you don't come back for over a month because you checked out on an island. I guess I'll know because I'm going to be like, uh, are, are we jumping on today or? No, girl, I'm in Fiji on an island. Gotta go. Yeah. No Wi-Fi here. Sorry. No Wi-Fi. You'll be sending like a letter in a bottle to me. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to get it. I'm kind of far away from the beach, but hey, if it makes it to Malibu, I might be able to find it. <laughs> dearest Breezy, I apologize for my abrupt departure, but you can only assume what has occurred and why I am no longer here and sending you this handwritten note that has floated across the seas for many to <laughs> yeah. for a fortnight. In like three years, I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> this is it. I'm going to be like, guess what? You won $55 million, but I just won the $870 million lotto. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and I'm driving a Range Rover. Boom. You could go back to your island. I don't need you. Yeah. <laughs> go back to the island. Go back to the island. This week's episode of the House of Hockey podcast is brought to you by... Looking to spice up your sex drive and your love life? Try Libido Drops for women. It's formulated to enrich your sexual response, arousal, and lubrication. Libido Drops are healthy and organic. Just add a few drops to water each day. Try Libido Drops with no risk, complete satisfaction guarantee, or your money back. Order your bottle of Libido Drops for women now at libidodrops.com. And we have a promo code for all of you House of Hockey podcast listeners. You will get 10% off your first order when you visit libidodrops.com. In the checkout, in the coupon code, enter HOCKEY10. That's HOCKEY10 for 10% off your first order of Libido Drops. Go to libidodrops.com. Our podcast is proud to be on the Hockey Podcast Network, and the network is home to many other incredible podcasts, including this one. Uh, you know what? I'm I, just I, so I... heated because of what, what you're telling me, because I, I do not want to live in a world <laughs> in a world where a craft dinner is the fucking substitute to a good macaroni. You're putting powder. No, no, no. Mac macaroni, as you call it, is a substitute for KD. God. <laughs> oh my God! Go to go to Italy. If you ask, open some no, 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 no. If you ask any Canadian 
would they rather have macaroni or KD? They will tell you KD is the best. It is superior. It is a fucking national treasure. And it is the greatest dish in Canada. I'm Mason Dixon, a Habs fan stuck in Leafs country, with my co-host Corey, a southern beauty trapped deep in the bayous of Louisiana. With over 2,500 kilometers of separation, we still managed to come together to give you Habs Nightly, your hub for Habs content. While I don't know what a kilometer is, I do know Habs hockey. Don't let the 10-year age gap or distance fool you. We bleed Blue Blanc every week, and we're known to serve up hot takes along with our unique charm. Join us every Monday and Thursday for Hockey Talk, Ref Rage, and your daily dose of Southern ignorance. Only on the Hockey Podcast Network. Katie is the superior macaroni and cheese. Get the fuck out of here. You put um, ketchup on your fucking macaroni, you nasty kid? Yes, I fucking do. This has been Habs Nightly. You guys have a great one. All right, it's time to get into the interview for this week with Sean Sidlowski. He is an American professional ice hockey winger. He currently plays for the Fort Wayne Comets. That's in Indiana of the ECHL. He has been playing since 2007. He played in the OHL. Uh, He's played in Norway? Nope. Norway. Yes. I wanted to yeah. say Finland. I was like, they're the two long ones together yeah. um, on the map. <laughs> he played in Norway for a season with the Frisk Asker. Uh, not even a full season, but he'll tell you all about his time over there. Um, but he loves playing for Fort Wayne for the Comets. He's got amazing things to say about the team. And he spent some time with Ryan O'Reilly of the NHL, oh. who you know. And yeah, please enjoy our conversation with Sid. <laughs> Come on, you're Polish. You should know how to say my last yeah, name. Yeah, I'm terrible. Though. That's what everyone says. And like, I don't know another word except punchki. And yak I'm not a real Polak. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not either. No. Uh, pierogies and um, yeah, okay, stuff. pierogies. Yes. Yeah. I still need to learn how to make those. They're really hard to make, actually. Right. I've tried. The dough is the hard part. Yeah, I got one of my good buddies. <laughs> a thoroughbred Italian and I watch him make pasta all the time. I go, why do you do this? Like yeah. six hours. <laughs> like, you want to eat your food, but right. hey, that's good. So teach his own. Teach his own. <laughs> anyway, it's cop check, like a cop and a check, but that doesn't look like how my name's spelled at all. So yeah, our substitute teachers probably loved us. I'm sh- Oh yeah. They would, uh, it's like you, they would go Rachel, and I just be like, yeah, uh, me, yeah, that's me. Yeah. I get the Sean S. Uh, Sean's. Yep. Y- yeah. Exactly. And you're just that's like, yeah, fun. just call me Sean. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Except what do they call you on the ice? Like, do you have a nickname? Sid. It's always been Sid. And I've got uh, Cody Soul end up giving me the nickname Sauce a few years ago, too, somehow. So I usually I run with Sauce. It's uh, It's pretty unique, I guess. So. Sauce because of your incredible passing goal is scoring. I don't know. Maybe I just like think I have a little bit of a swagger to me, and you just that's the word that came to mind. I don't know. That's what I tell myself at least. Like you're saucy. But yeah, there you go. Yeah. What's that <laughs> yeah, saying? Like, it's isn't it like uh, juice is temporary, but sauce is forever? Isn't that what like the the kids what? say nowadays? Do they say that? I think they do. Yeah. I'm gonna I use think, that if they you do. Should. You, you should. I think it's juice is temporary or something like that and sauce okay. is forever. So. Yeah, well, I, I sure as shit don't want to live forever the way this world's going anymore. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know even I want sauce to be forever. I don't even know what that means. What does that even mean? I, uh, good juice question. is temporary. What the fuck are you? What are these kids talking about? <laughs> I, I'm lost anymore. I have yeah. no idea. Well, so we got the nickname part out, out of uh, out of the What's the word I'm looking for? Out of the way? Yes. I was going to say out of the question. And I was like, that's not the right (laughs) word. So anyway, 
your sauce or Sid. Whatever you prefer. It's, it's <laughs> rare for me to be called Sean, unless you're a family member, that's for sure. All right. Um, so tell everybody where you are now. You're in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And yes, tell us what's happening with the league and your team and, and where you're at as of you know today, January 20-something. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, I am uh, in my apartment in Fort Wayne now. I just uh, got down here probably about 48 hours ago um or even less than that so it's uh kind of just got into town and uh came from uh St. Clair Shores Michigan where I'm originally from and we all had to get into town basically drop our equipment off at the rink uh we all maybe stop by the team office if you need to grab anything and it was basically uh get to your apartment and uh lock yourself in um we all had to go get a PCR COVID test done uh you know the good old brain tickler which fortunately uh I must have had a, a good one because I've heard some horror stories and people say you get a good one, a bad one here and there. Well, fortunately, I got a, must have got a good one because it wasn't too bad. And uh, we all just have to quarantine in our apartment up until we get a negative test back. And then we're kind of free to, to go on the ice or go about a little bit. But, you know, there's uh, really not much to do this year as we're all trying to stay within a little bit of a bubble, which it is what it is. But uh, fortunately, I got uh, one teammate right across the my balcony here um, and Anthony Petrozelli. So we can just at least wave back and forth to each other. So that's it. That's about all the fun we're going to have uh, this year, other than playing hockey. You got to make one of those old school, speaking of like the kids today, you got to get like two <laughs> cans with a string and throw it across. And No joke. We're talking about doing that. <laughs> we're I, walkie I talkies, you're like you know? out of pure boredom. We should just do this. Yeah. See if it actually works. Cause like, I definitely never tried that as a kid. Yeah, it would until I get annoyed of them and I would just sniff that line real fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell our listeners basically who you're playing for currently and what teams you have played for just so they can kind of get an idea of, of your background. Absolutely. Well, um, I play for the Fort Wayne Comets right now um, and I have been. This will be my eighth season coming up, which dating myself, I guess, uh, which, you know, I, I I definitely feel like age is a number at this point, though I feel older than I am uh, physically, mentally, I definitely don't. So I, I get what everyone was telling me uh, as you get older, you know, those stories back in the day. So uh, I'm starting to feel that a bit. But um, so I originally uh, from Michigan, like I said, I ended up playing four years in the OHL for the Erie Otters. Um, after that, I signed uh, an entry level contract with the Buffalo Sabres. Um, I played in Rochester. Uh, for the Rochester Americans the year after that. Um, unfortunately, my second year pro was uh, the lockout season um, or the last lockout season. So I was uh, in the Central League with the Fort Worth Brahmas um, at that time, which uh, Texas is probably one of my favorite places in the world after living there for a year. That was awesome. So uh, after that, I've been in Fort Wayne ever since. I've had a few call-ups, uh, you know, with Cleveland, Norfolk, Binghamton, a few teams like that. In other words, I've been in Fort Wayne for the last little while here nice and how was it you played um in what was it norway yes i did leave that one out that was a, a short little stint but um i did go over to norway uh about three years ago now and uh, i think i only played about 11 games um so it was just uh ended up just kind of being like a you know i wasn't ready for it type thing everyone was kind of telling me i should go and you know you can make good money over there of course which i was but i, I think just going by myself um, I was just in a somewhat of a new relationship at the time that played into it. I miss Fort Wayne, of course, miss the parents, but other than that, I absolutely, uh, love Norway as a country and, you know, the people are, you know, I almost say it's like a, it's Canada of Europe because everyone's so <laughs> nice, like nicest people in the world. Um, so I relate it to that in regards to, you know, just how the people were and how they treated you, but, um, you know, just over there it's of course you get to see a little different lifestyle and it's one thing that just amazed me over there is like how in shape everyone is and they they just care about their health and well-being so much that you know i watched all these people you know running up and down these steep hills or you know they love their cross-country skiing so even in the summer they had like skis with roller wheels on them and they're still doing it up and down Jeez. these hills and i was just i was blown away but other than that the country is just absolutely gorgeous and you know, site-wise. So if anyone's traveling, you know, I don't think Norway's ever really been the most appealing place to go, but I'm telling you, it's probably one of the most visually stunning places you could ever see. Cool. 
Did you get uh, to travel around Europe while you were there? I did a little bit. Um, I actually ended up leaving uh, right when we were supposed to go on one of the the international or the national team breaks, as they call it over there. Um, so we would have had like five days off and I, I was going to go up to Northern Norway and do like a, they had like a three day snowmobiling trip all across oh. Northern Norway along the water. And you get to see the Northern lights, which is one thing I've always wanted to see. Um, but go figure. I ended up leaving the day before I was supposed to do that. Um, but other than that, I did get to, we went to Copenhagen, um, saw that that's, that place is, very cool. Um, I couldn't believe though that some bars could be open till seven in the morning. Um, I was, I was told by a couple of the players there that, you know, they're used to kind of like pre-gaming at midnight until three in the morning and then they go out and I'm like that, like, that's just insane to me. Like, especially being 30 now, I'm like pre-game at midnight. Oh, it's wait. called end game at midnight. And yeah. Like that's, <laughs> that's me. So no thanks for that. But uh, that was cool. And then uh, the only other places I really got to travel to uh, socially was uh, we went to Gothenburg, Sweden, a few of us uh, for a weekend. So we did get to travel around there. And that was just, you know, a lot of walking around and alcohol, basically, but uh, did it with a few teammates. So that was fun. Yeah. Describe the the style of play in Norway for people who maybe aren't familiar. Like, how, how would you compare the game on the ice uh, to to somewhere else? Uh, it's it's really it's it's foreign literally and figuratively to what we're used to um it's kind of you know it's it's almost soccer in a sense you know like i said they have their national team break so they're all kind of they have their own format you know it's kind of just the european style if you will and uh you know it's a little bit more of a puck possession game there's not as much offense as you think, you know, it's, you think of European hockey, you think of skill, speed, all this stuff, which it is, but if they don't have a full blown good opportunity, a lot of the times guys will turn back with the puck and kind of just everyone regroups together and then try again kind of thing. So it's kind of almost like this just back and forth of trying to keep the puck, which puck possession is definitely a good thing, but at some point, you know, it's just, it's, we're used to something else and that's just the way it is. So I, and it's definitely the physicality obviously is the biggest thing that just, it's kind of absent over there. You know, it's, uh, there might be a couple guys who throw a body check here and there, but fighting, you know, isn't even technically allowed really. I mean, it is, but you get kicked out of the game if you drop your gloves, which that ended up being half a reason why I left too, is I, I had one altercation with a guy and, you know, my instinct, of course, get into a fight while well, my gloves come off immediately because that's what we do here. Well, his stayed on and, you know, I ended up winning the fight, you know, in my opinion, needless to say, um, but I ended up getting suspended for three games because of that, oh. which here, you know, I get a five minute penalty and then I'm playing right away again. Well, no, once they told me I got three game suspension and we had a national team break, I wouldn't have played a game for about three weeks. So that's when I was like, you know, it was just tough. And that kind of just shoved me along to come back uh, since I was already missing a little bit too. So that's all, uh, all of it in a nutshell, basically. Dang. Would you say that bringing back like, or adapting your play a little bit with like some Norwegian play, I guess is the best way to, to bring it back to the States. Do you think it would be beneficial to kind of bring that kind of play or is it more it should stay oh, yeah. in, uh, I mean, in Norway. <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't mean to, uh, like, there's definitely, uh, it wasn't all negative in terms of, you know, the way the style was. There were definitely a lot of, you know, very good, capable players over there that, you know, it's, they'd be very comparable to our ECHL or, or some would be American League players, stuff like that. Like, they, it's just different, you know, if you don't have a bona fide NHL shot why would you leave your home country and come play in one of our minor pro leagues? You know, it just doesn't make sense. So it's, there's very capable players over there. Some guys do have North American experience, whether it be pro college, stuff like that too. And, uh, you know, even uh, I, on my team, I played for a, a team called Frisk Asker um, and our captain, um, his last name's Bastionson, but he was uh, a captain of like the Norwegian national team um, and all the international tournaments and stuff like that. So I came in, here's this guy, 40, 40 years old that might, you see him initially, you know, he's a bald guy, like just looks like a normal 
40 year old who's in good shape, of course, but you would look at him and not think, Oh, this guy's an athlete. You know, he almost looks too old to be one. And you know, it, it was our first line center. So that, that was a guy I definitely drew a lot from just watching, you know, his patience with the puck. He was almost very similar to me that he was a bigger guy. Um, but with the puck, he had just that patience and kind of slowed the game down to his pace. Um, you know, wasn't trying to do all the skilled things. So like watching him and knowing the players he's played with, the experience he's had, and just overall the person he was too. It's I learned a lot from him specifically. Cool. Describe um, what kind of player are you on the ice? Are you a chirper? Are you super competitive? Um, are you the the team guy? Are you the morale? Like, what's your like personality on the ice like? Uh, I'd like to think I'm a little bit of everything. I, it's something I kind of I kind of take pride in, and I think it was it was easy for me to like have a lot of a lot of the game within my own, if that makes sense. Just growing up um, a Detroit resident, I grew up watching the Red Wings and, you know, they made the playoffs for 25 straight years. Well, that started the year I was born. So the first 25 years of my life, I was watching some of the best hockey teams that have ever been assembled, to be honest, and some of the best players that I've ever played. And um, so, you know, like Steve Eiserman, Steve Eiserman was my biggest idol growing up, um, obviously. Red Wings captain for a long time and mm -hmm. a skilled guy who played through pain, injuries, block shots, did all the defensive stuff. I love like Brendan Shanahan, who was more of a <laughs> tough guy who could also score. They all they had Darren McCarty, who just beat the wheels off guys, Joe Coach, like guys like that. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, we, everyone in Detroit loved the grind line, which was McCarty, Draper, and Maltby, which, you know, it's funny too is like you look at these guys in the nhl and you're like oh they play on the third fourth line they're not very good hockey players well i remember when i was like i must have been like 14 i went out to like one of my dad's uh beer league skates and someone one of his friends was neighbors with kirk malby and he ended up coming out just to play for fun and when i saw his skill on the ice at like 14 i was like this guy's that good and he looks that <laughs> bad in the NHL. Like he, not that he looked bad in the NHL, but he plays on the fourth line, you know, it's like, yeah. he has the skill like through the roof, but you, that makes you realize how good the NHL is. And it was just insane to see that and have that perspective. So I kind of appreciated that at a young age. So I've, I've got, you know, I'd like to score goals, but I, I definitely need a physical altercation every now and then as well. It's just, <laughs> I don't know some, something about it I just you know I appreciate I guess yeah it definitely yeah. amps up the boys it you know gives you that little extra I don't know push maybe um yeah well I, I'd be the one to always defend my teammates too it's just that I don't know I don't have a specific reason for it but I've never liked a bully per se so when I see that knowing I might be able to protect someone else like I I always wanted to protect my friends in school. Thank God I never had to. I've never, never wanted to or gotten into a fight off the ice. So it's like that I'm glad for, but I would have, I would have been the first person to do it. So for some reason, I've always had that instilled in me. So it carries over onto the ice. So yeah. that, I, you know, that aids into, you know, maybe I get a free one here and there because <laughs> someone's picking on my teammate. So, you know, it's just yeah. stuff like that. But I definitely, uh, you know, have the team mentality first for sure I, I one thing I do not like in anybody is a cocky person yeah tell us about um the Joe I'm going to take us down a little bit of a different road but the the Joe where the Red Wings used to play was a oh, yeah. super famous mm -hmm. um arena they don't play there anymore they play at Little Caesars um but tell us about I'm, I'm assuming you went and saw games there uh, so if you did tell us uh about that experience. Cause we've talked to a lot of people about playing, you know, when they play, not that you played in the Joe, I but like, well. yeah. what? I have as well. I, you have? Yeah. So while well, not professionally, but right. I, uh, I did grow up playing minor hockey for little Caesars for probably six, seven years of my life. And uh, of course, little Caesars is owned by Mike Illich who owns the Red Wings. Um, so we used to get to practice at Joe Lewis a lot once we were, 12 to 16 they like to have a lot of the teams practice basically out of joe lewis so i skated there a bunch and uh i actually did go to 
Grand Rapids Griffins camp now that I think about it one year. So I did technically have a pro practice in Joe Lewis. So, uh, but uh, just a phenomenal building, um, so much history in it, of course. I, I did grow up going to games there, went to my first one there. Um, I, I don't think I was there in the last couple of years, but of course everyone, you know, calling it old and oh, they need a new one. It's like, I don't think anyone who frequents games there throughout the years ever thought about it really. Like no one else was complaining. Like, yeah, the, the corridors were small, the bathroom lines were terribly long, but like, it was just something you're used to. Cause it's, Hey, I'm at a Red Wings game. So, all right, we'll stay at home and watch it if you don't like it. So like that stuff I always laughed at, like, why do you guys need all this stuff? You're going to a hockey game. You're not going to a party. So you want that stuff, stay at home, invite friends over. So, um, but no, I love that. So like my, uh, my uncle um, had season tickets in his family uh, for a long time. Now his dad had a pretty high up job at Ford uh, back when he was growing up. So um, they had uh, season tickets back since, geez, it had to be at the fifties and they're always seven rows off the ice. So, uh, and Joe Lewis, you know, they, used to have that short glass too they never had the really super tall glass so we were literally the row right above like the oh, glass wow. like you could just see everything so vividly and like felt like you were on the ice almost and it was awesome so uh you know my uncle and my dad were at all the you know cup winning games there they never took me of course but <laughs> i was i was a little too young back then to really appreciate it so i understand it but i got to watch those from home and i of course went to plenty of other playoff games but yeah tremendous uh history there i was my favorite game though i was at the uh not the first brawl the claude lemieux mccarty one that everyone knows about but i was at the what became, I guess, the second uh, happening of that situation when Osgood and Wah fought. So I was at that game in person. I remember that just like, that, that's maybe why I'm a little bit of a psycho. I grew up watching this stuff <laughs> and I, I absolutely loved it. And everyone else did. When you're in a, a building of 20,000 and everyone gets on their feet and goes bananas when two guys are fighting. You're like, okay, this is like, you just feel that energy. I don't care who you are. If you're in the crowd, like, I always love the quote. Uh, I think Don Cherry said it, but he said, you know, do you ever see anyone getting up and going for a drink when there's a fight? No, like people run from the concession stand back to watch the fight. So it's like, I guess that's where I get a little bit of that from. And uh, fortunately, I've also been okay at it. Yeah. It didn't get <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Time, so yeah. Oh, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's stay on the, uh, the arena talk. Can you tell us how the Comets arena is and the fans and kind of, any fun chance they do or uh chance no that would have been a norway thing for sure there's definitely uh that was a norway every building had their soccer type chant and multiple chants they do throughout the game so that was actually a cool uh different experience type thing but um as far as fort wayne i uh, couldn't say enough good things about it um it's really it, it's funny because i think it gets like initially if you don't really know much about the city or the team you just hear Fort Wayne, Indiana, and you're like, eh, kind of middle of nowhere. Like it just doesn't, you know, have that appeal because you just don't hear about it much. And that was kind of my first reaction um, when I first came here. But the second I played a game in the arena, it was like, nope, love this place because, I, I mean, we average seven thousand fans, you know, wow. during the whole season. And there's, you know, on the weekends it's usually more towards nine, ten, eleven if we sell out. And you know, you have eleven thousand people. That's sold incredible. Out arena. It's a mini NHL arena. So yeah. uh, just, I've always been the type of guy I don't care about, you know, living in Florida, even though of course I would, but I don't <laughs> pick my hockey team based on the location. Like I appreciate a, a city that appreciates us, you know, and it's, if you have a game where you have 9,000 people at home, you're always excited for that. And if you have 900, not that exciting, you know, it's, especially at a 10,000 seat arena, it would sound like, you know, golf claps basically. So, um, you know, there's plenty of arenas that are like that, unfortunately. And when you go there, it's, you know, it was like a place like Barry in the OHL, we used to call their arena, the library, because there was <laughs> literally a hundred people there a game and they didn't really get, you know, too chanty for anything. So it was just like, when you go there, you're like, 
all right, can we just play running time, please? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Get that out of here. Thing. so yeah, so Fort Wayne, unbelievable. The rink, you know, the rink's one of the older ones too. So it's almost like my Joe Lewis now. It's like, I almost have the same, you know, uh, feeling about it as I did Joe Lewis. It's personal to me now and it's almost a second home. So it's, uh, that's what it's become. And that's why I'm still here. Incredible. Good thing. So who have, let's just say who has been the most influential person like you've ever played with? Uh, whew, uh, ever played with probably, I, I mean, I only played with them for two years, but it, I'd have to say Ryan O'Reilly. And I'm not just saying that because of what he's accomplished lately. It was uh, if anyone, if you ask anyone who knew me back in the day, I was talking about him the same exact way. It was uh it was kind of weird. It was like almost like your first like maturing moment for me, I guess, going because, you know, he's a year younger than me. I, I was born in 1990. He's born in 1991. And we both came into the OHL the same year um, and played together in Erie. And when he came in, he was already kind of a man for a 15 year old or 16 year old. Like he's he had that just, full beard at 15. He looked, like, he looked like a Ninja turtle. Like his abs were like just shredded. Like the guy just like didn't have an ounce of body fat. Like he, ne he wasn't like the fastest, most athletic guy, but like the work ethic and maturity he had was just like mind blowing. And like he had skill that he doesn't necessarily show in the game, but he works on so much stuff specific to what would make him successful and you see now he's wildly successful and uh you know he deserves everything he's got because that that was the maturing moment i was getting to though going i'm a year older than this kid but i look up to him i was like what the hell is wrong with this like i was like why is like why can't i do what he does kind of thing and you know i always respected him and you know he did things the right way his whole whole life and worked his ass off so that's why i say he's deserving everything he got and i'm super happy for the guy so what was it about him that you learned from him? Just like the work ethic uh, or something like that, or like how to do crunches so you could look like him or like what? <laughs> I'm still trying to find that secret. <laughs> my, my abs don't look like that guy's did because uh, that was a different level. But um, no, I, like you said, yeah, it was like the work ethic mainly. Um, and I admired his skill, mm -hmm. uh, just like stuff he used to like, he used to do like, he was ahead of his time, to be honest. Like, I guess he, he might have had a good head start because his dad, uh, Brian, was a Canadian Olympic trainer. Um, like, he trained Canadian volleyball, basketball, like all different sports. So, um, like Ryan and his brother were just so super competitive. Like they would they would compete in everything they did. It didn't matter. So, um, like that was a huge part of it. But I remember like Ryan used to at the end of practice used to make our coach like throw like basically shoot the puck like hip high off the ice and like Ryan would like knock him down right to the ice like pull the puck and shoot and like he would do this forehand and then backhand he'd do him one hand and like yeah he wouldn't you know obviously knock them all down 100 percent of the time but like he would work on this stuff until you saw him like only missing one and I was just going like I would try it and I would miss like seven of them <laughs> I, like I feel like I have good hand-eye coordination and better than most so like doing that like it was a humbling humbling little thing and he was just he, he was the quiet leader type you know he didn't say really anything he was a young kid back then but he did all the right things and the loud people are usually the ones who don't deserve what they're talking about you know it's always the guys who are sitting in the corner by themselves minding their own business that mm -hmm. if you saw what they actually did you'd be like holy shit. So that's exactly who Ryan was. And I always, like I said, I admired it. I, I think that's interesting to hear that about O'Reilly. Um, he's not somebody we've heard about yet, like from a firsthand story experience from any of the uh, players we, we've interviewed. And I, not to make this about me, but I would you could, I had the opportunity to interview him um, at the NHL awards after they won with the cup. And he's just the nicest guy answered every question, totally humble, genuine, authentic. And you could feel that it wasn't an act. It wasn't a show. Like, 
Um, so for, for just to reiterate and, and second what you're saying, like it, it's well-deserved, like the guy, it's good to hear that he, you know, he's put in the work and he's been on this path and it's well-deserved. You love yeah, to see moments like that for, for the, for the good guys, if you will, you know? No, and he is. And it's like, see, that's like, that's the thing too. You might meet him. And if you don't really like have anyone who knows him or you haven't known him yourself, you might be like, Oh, okay. Of course. It's just like, he puts on the nice guy hat in front of me and then who knows what he's really like in real life. But no, that's, that's who he is. He's uh, always been himself. As far as I know, you know, I haven't played with him in a long time, but uh, Mm -hmm. all I can say now is he looks like he should be in a folk band. (laughs) <laughs> he does like yeah, he Mumford does. and Sons or something yeah like he's got every fedora and his beard down to here and he's definitely got a few products and a brush I know that much but uh <laughs> but yeah no it was uh yeah. good kid and like I, I swear like I could mention like the only other thing that like, I I found so just insane for our age too is like like I said um him and his brother used to go at it and everything and uh there are a few years I actually actually would drive up to to Canada to work out with him and his dad in the summer. Um, And, you know, it was only like an hour and a half drive for me. So I did that, I think two or three years in a row. And I never wanted to go back after the first year because my God, the stuff they did was just like, I hated working out back then. And (laughs) when I had to go do that stuff, I I just loathed it. But I remember just like the first time. So like every other day we would do like this, uh, it's a four kilometer, five kilometer run, something like that. And every day you do it, you have to beat your time from the previous run or else you have to do it right away again. And so like that terrified me, but the story was really like, we all started, you know, there are two groups and I was in the group with Ryan and his brother. So we start and like knowing it's a five kilometer run, I'm like, first pace myself, first thought, pace yourself. These two psychopaths, no, the second the whistle goes, dead sprint, gone, like side by side, just trying to beat each other from the start. And there's a point in the race where like it opens back up and like we have to run up this steep hill and there's like a bridge at the top. And like I round this corner out of like the trees we're running through and get back out on the open road and I can see them again. And they're like probably already a mile up the hill, still side by side, like, and you could tell they're in a dead sprint trying to beat each other literally to the last second and then we'd go skate later at night and like i saw them fist fight on the ice during a scrimmage and it's like they're just like that's why they're both successful i mean you might not know much about cal his brother but ryan as skilled as he was like i said cal was twice as skilled just didn't get you know the opportunity or breaks that maybe ryan did but cal was unbelievable hockey player himself too so it's just like I can, I can tell a few more stories about that type of stuff, but just insane for doing that at 16 years old, you know? Oh yeah. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Well, tell us some stories about you in, in the ECHL and like, we love a funny story. We love a, a fight, a prank, a rookie party, um, missing a bus, you know, give us whatever you feel like comfortable sharing. That's not going to piss any of your teammates or friends off. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I could come back on the podcast when I'm retired and really uh, let okay. today, but um, we're going to hold you to that. No, yeah, that's all right. I'll, I'd be free <laughs> to do that. But, um, you know, there's been there's been a lot of stuff over the years here. Um, I mean, basically everywhere you play it. I mean, I think that's the best thing about playing the sport or, you know, the memories, the stories, all that type of stuff, the guys you meet. Um, but just trying to think specifically, like I know, uh, you know, fight, like fight story wise, I still like my favorite is uh, in playoffs. And I think it was 2017, 2018 season. Uh, we were in the conference finals and playing against the Colorado Eagles. And we were in uh, Colorado for our first game. And like, they were like the big bad team of the West. We were like the big tough team from the East. And like, uh, you know, we ended up, well, I guess we were in the West division, but you know, we were, little bit more east than they are of course so uh we end up meeting up like first game so first game in colorado and like a couple guys end up you know of course always saying stuff to each other passing the red line like chirping which i don't do a ton of i just i tend to just laugh when this stuff happens because i'm just like we can do it so like you want to do this i'm I'm still right here like i i just i would rather 
I, I don't talk. So like I You talk with your I, fists, right? Oh, exactly. But <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I swear I it, it's hilarious though because I know if a guy ever smiled or laughed at me if I was actually like trying to get under their skin, it would piss me off even more. So <laughs> it works. It's just like a little mental mind game. You ever want to really piss someone off, just just smile at them and everything they say. So I was doing, we were doing that type of shit at the red line. And then, uh, you know, it ended up just being like a group of five guys and 10. And then like, it was literally all 20 guys on each team were like just, and there's a YouTube video of it, but um, no refs on the ice. Cause it's warm ups, of course. And uh, so like, <laughs> there's like a couple guys spearing each other and like uh, there ended up being a couple fights out of it. Like Dan Maggio on our team and uh, Dennis Kravchenko, like two both, pretty tough guys ended up fighting in warmups and like, and, and that's like the thing I love about hockey though. You know, it was like once, you know, someone won the fight, it was clear that everyone kind of just like separated, like you break it up. Right. Like there's that mutual respect that like, you don't stay on top of a guy and keep, you know, beating the shit out of them or else someone's probably going to do that to you. So it was like, they had those two fights and like, I just remember like the only reason I tell the story is because usually I probably would have been one of those guys to do that. Cause if that's happening, I want to be in the middle of it so badly. But I, if you watch this video, I'm literally like, you see me going around like the back outside of our team, just like watching what's happening. But I have uh, like, I have a herniated disc in my back. And at that time, like it was so bad that like, I literally, I couldn't like stand up past like, I'd say almost 90 degrees. So like trying to play that game, I was already struggling. And then we get on the ice and I'm like, of course this is happening right now. So like, <laughs> I'm just look, looking around there going, I, I hope nothing happens because if I have to fight right now, I'm in big trouble. Cause you can see me just like, I would bend over every five seconds, like stretch and then stand back up, look around. Nope. Okay. Stretch again. And like, I was just trying to like get my back to feel all right. Cause I was like, I'm going to have to fight someone in a second. So luckily that didn't happen. And, uh, I got through those couple of games, but yeah, that was a bit of a nightmare, but still one of my favorite stories, just being on the ice and just that, that competitiveness boiling over the edge. Sometimes it's, it's a little fun as sick as it sounds. I mean, I think that's why hockey fans love the game, right? Like, well, no one goes to NASCAR to watch everyone drive a successful 200 laps, right? And everyone's like, crash, crash, crash. Right. Not for the driver's sake, but see, it's right. just it's something about a collision of any sort. Yeah. That's yeah. What people love. It's like the unpredictability of it. You don't know when that's going to happen in like, it keeps you on the edge of your seat and it, and it brings up that emotional, like sort of anticipation of like, you're stoked, you're watching your team. And then like, all of a sudden you get a fight out of nowhere and you're just like, what? And it just yeah. adds this level of excitement that I don't think we get to experience too much as adults, you know, in, in our everyday life, you know, <laughs> like I can't yeah, think no, what we like, yeah, that adrenaline, that spike, that excitement. And, um, you know, it's, it's a feeling we don't get as adults. We get that as kids a lot, you know, but like, I'm not like adrenaline spiking when I like get a bill in the mail or, you know, like, <laughs> right. or, or like if I decide to like buy some ice cream and treat myself, I'm not I like, know. I've, told my, <laughs> I've told my mom that before. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing after hockey yet, but like, if I have like an office job, like I, I want there to be a day where like I walk in the door and like, I feel like I have to fight someone. Like, <laughs> I want that like little, like, like you said, like that unpredictability, like I want someone to like want to kick my ass one day. Like it's, it's going to be a weird transition. Cause like you said, I don't know where I'm going to get that adrenaline from. Like I might just feel like take up skydiving. Yeah. Or you have to work like a retail store and deal with a bunch of angry oh. like soccer moms. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't, no. I don't have the patience for assholes anymore. No, but, you'd have yeah. to work in hockey. I think you'd have to stay in it. Yeah. Something like that. Or I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't even know what. It's an interesting thing to talk about the sport in that way of like the feelings that come up for fans, because we're always trying to find out from everybody we talk to what makes hockey so unique compared to the other professional sports. So from your perspective, what is it about hockey um, that like, does it for you that like gives you 
the warm fuzzy feelings and like the joy to keep playing and to play through pain and injury and like keep going yeah i i mean i honestly think it's the human beings it's it's literally it that's the funniest part about the fighting and hockey and i tell everyone like it's not fighting on the level you think it is it's not like two guys going out already aggressive like i just want to go out and hurt somebody I don't think there's been, okay, there's definitely been someone like that, but they're probably weeded out very fast because they do something stupid or they have off ice issues, obviously. So like, <laughs> it's always like, it is a protection thing. It's a, just a team. It's a family, right? Like if someone breaks in your house tonight, like, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to try to hurt them mm -hmm. before they hurt you or your family. So it's the exact mentality. And I think it weeds out bullies so fast and it puts people in their place like that because like it, I, I I won't lie I was one of those kids I didn't think I was the toughest and like I was kind of a little afraid of fighting at first but like I was always cocky a bit of like if okay if I did I'd be all right well I I hope it's deleted by now but if there's a video of my first fight in the OHL it is embarrassing like it <laughs> looks like two guys like I, I don't even know. Like, it's not a dance. It's not, it's, it's awkward. It looks awkward. That is the best way I can describe it. And so like, I found out very quick that I am not as tough as I think I am. I am, you know, there's like, if I piss that guy off, that guy, like he's going to beat the shit out. Like so I was literally like, I had to very early on in my career, know who to mess with, who not to. And it's just like that right away goes, okay, I can't be like this, like to everybody. Cause I don't know what, if I saw this guy on the street, I wouldn't know he's that tough. So it's like, that's always been in the back of my head too. Is like, I don't want to fight anyone at a bar. Cause it's like, what if I run into an MMA fighter? And I'm the copy yeah. guy that's like, I'd beat the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> like, that's just, I, I think a lot of guys need that experience because I have even a lot of my high school buddies were the same way, like, or still could be like, Oh, let's get in a bar fight. I'm like, you guys are idiots. Like it ain't as fun as you think it is. Like getting punched in the face hurts. Also punching someone actually kind of hurts. Like you're going to wake up hurting one way or another or off the ice, obviously go to jail. So that's just stupid. But um, so that's what it is. I think it's honestly just the human beings. I've always had good coaches that were just like, truly genuine cared about you I think like also too is like my dad is like literally the most genuine guy in the entire world like the nicest like it, like it almost pisses me off sometimes because I don't have the patience he does I don't like I like yeah I could talk like I don't mind like having a conversation with a stranger or anything like that but like just you know I don't have the patience to deal with everyone all the time my dad's just the type of guy that would give you the time of day shirt off his back the whole thing so he was my introduction to hockey because he was a hockey player it's basically translated all the way through the sport just people like him you know all that type of stuff it's just great people and that's what keeps you coming back so it's like yeah I love playing hockey but I also love hanging out with these guys so it's like I don't want to lose my friends and hockey so that's really what keeps me coming back more than anything yeah Tell us more about growing up playing hockey. Like when did you first get on the ice? You said your dad was the, was the reason why you started. So tell us about, tell us about that experience. Yeah, no, he was a, he was a semi-professional player himself. He was actually a, a good hockey player. Like I've seen it, but obviously didn't see him play back then. And all his buddies, you know, reaffirmed. Yeah, he was a good hockey player. And um, he uh, ended up kind of similar to me, had a, uh, back injury during a game and uh you know that kind of ended his career but um you know like that year he was in the red wings uh rookie camp uh stuff like that so he was, he was at the basically pretty equivalent to the level i was at and stuff like that so uh my mom also even played hockey you know she played co-ed hockey later on in her life stuff like that she was a great athlete she was a a softball player back in high school and I believe she still holds a couple records like softball wise in her high school. So yeah, so that's, uh, I came from a pretty athletic family. So, uh, but hockey's always been the first love for sure. And I think that was a huge part to my dad, of course, but 
Um, you know, I tell everyone like my intro to hockey was so early that I could sing the Canadian national anthem <laughs> or I could sing the U S national anthem. Cause in Detroit, we would get hockey night in Canada. Cause we were just right across the Windsor mm. from or right across the river from Windsor. So I was watching Don Cherry, Ron McLean ever since I was a kid. And we were watching every hockey night in Canada game. I went to Windsor Spitfires games, all that stuff. So uh, it was that early for me. So I was probably, I know I could definitely skate at two years old. Um, wow. And then I was playing organized hockey at four. So I was one of the ones who started super early. And if I wasn't at the rink on the ice, I was in my backyard on my rollerblades outside all day you know very unlike the kids today but mm -hmm. i didn't you know i didn't sit inside i don't i maybe had one favorite tv show back in the day because i was outside all the time and that's just how it was so i was just an active kid and hockey is the thing i love doing more than anything so being from detroit that's obviously easy with the red wings and just yeah. the sheer amount of hockey players as well and you know it's a passion all throughout the state so there was a lot of people i had that in common with and i was able to practice play whenever I wanted. So that's basically my life all the way up until Erie when I left. It's a good yeah. story. And you were able to uh, obviously make a bit of a name for yourself and play with some big boys. So um, we saw that you have worn quite a few different numbers. Do you have a reason of picking numbers or is it just kind of the luck of the draw? Yeah. Once strategy there? Pro, once you get the pro, you're kind of, you know, it's kind of what they give you unless you're, you know, returning for a team, then they kind of give you the choice. If you're a rookie, you're basically like, this is what you're wearing. Uh, so like when I went to Buffalo, I was training camp, I was given 38, like <laughs> not, not a very attractive number to me, at least. Uh, <laughs> I don't think, think many of you guys wear number 38 in any league. Yeah. So uh, needless to say, if I would have played NHL games for Buffalo, I probably unfortunately would have had to wear 38. Um, so that would not have been my choice, but uh, 19 for sure. Like I said, Stevie, Stevie Eiserman is my favorite of all time. And, uh, you know, I even used to have the necklace with the number 19 charm on it and wear all that stuff. So 19 has always been my favorite number. So if I could wear it, that's what I'm wearing. Um, other than that, I've either been given a choice of a couple numbers or just been given one. And, uh, in terms of Fort Wayne, I think 27, I was just given to my first nerd. They gave me, I think it was like 27 or 94 I could wear my first year. And I don't know about you, but if you see 94 and then Sidlowski across the top, it's just like, a, there's too much <laughs> going on on that jersey. Yeah. So I kind of would like a skinnier number. I guess. Yeah. So I picked 27 and I guess uh, Jeremy Roenick wore 27. So I was like, all right, Ameri U.S. Hall of Famer. I could, I could wear 27. So that's yeah. it. It'd be 19 though, if I got a choice or actually my, my second would be number nine because of my dad, my dad always, uh, and to this day loves Gordie Howe, probably, probably loves Gordie Howe just as much as me. That's, that's my dad in hockey for you. So yeah, he, uh, he always wore number nine, so uh, I would have picked that one if I had a second choice. Solid choices. I have to agree. You know, yeah, it's funny. I, yeah, I mean, I never really thought about kind of having to have your last name pictured on your jersey to make sure that, like, it doesn't look. Oh, it's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that before. A lot of guys, like, yeah, see, it's like a lot of, a lot of guys, I think, with a last name as long as mine, they would pick a one-digit number. Yeah. And because, like, imagine, like, instead of Gretzky, it was Sidlowski <laughs> all the way across <laughs> 99. Like, yeah. you'd be like, uh, the guy, I'd feel bad for the guy stitching that on a jersey. It'd be like too much work. Yeah, so, that's tough. Yeah. So, uh, that's usually a little unwritten hockey rule for you. That's cool. I never yeah. heard that. I never heard that, that there's like a little bit of vanity to it. <laughs> yeah, there kind of is. Okay, Go so ahead. we ask all of our guests these three questions. Man, woman, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and you are going to hopefully think they're funny. Uh, so <laughs> the first question well, is... Well, I like comedy. Well, I mean, we're not comedians, but, you know, we try. So I've laughed a bit. Okay. Give a little more credit. All right, good, yeah. good. As long as you have a good time, you know, that's what matters. Not so... <laughs> um. Who is your favorite hockey hunk? Ooh. I'm not afraid to answer this one, but I'm going to have to think. 
because there's there's a lot of good looking ones now mm-hmm. uh, i think like i'd probably you know what i'd probably deliberate on this a little more if i if i had the time but uh sergey fedorov was like my all-time like just like in a hockey uniform though like you take him out of a uniform nowadays i might have to say like miles wood that kid's a stud yeah. like he's, I, he's a gorgeous man so. even without <laughs> all of his top row teeth he's a hunk uh, that's what i mean so like i see a picture of that guy i'm like all right yeah he's good looking but no he definitely <laughs> is uh, had a good looking hockey player on the ice too so yeah uh he's kind of the modern era one but like sergey fedorov back in the day was like he had the blonde flowing hair like you know he, he was a good looking guy he had the white nike skates he was like he was just like flashy it was so good and then he was dating anna kornikova at the time too that she was also very good looking and it was just like those two were like sort of my power couple for some reason i guess just the hockey of course but um so i think i would have to go with sergey fedorov though as a right i'd say steve eiserman but i'll give you a different answer i like it yeah <laughs> stevie Y is i think he's gotten stevie's yes. still hot i would say he's gotten better with age he's got the salt and pepper going yeah. nice tan still from tampa oh. i know he's the, he learned a lot from chelly apparently my favorite <laughs> yeah <laughs> Him and Shelly are permanently tanned. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, Shelly's just a Greek god, so. Well, that too. Yeah. yeah. Speak <laughs> of attractive women, who is your favorite hockey lady? It doesn't have to be attractive, but. Hockey lady, um, I would probably have to say um, now nowadays after hearing a couple of interviews she's done. Uh, uh, Rayom, uh, Manel Rayom, she was, uh, like her story, like, like, cause I heard her on Spit and Chicklets, the interview she did with them and like just her whole story. And like, he didn't, like, I remember when she, like the story, when she, uh, played for Tampa Bay, like I remember of course being a, a young dumb boy, I was like, what's a girl doing playing hockey? And like, but now like, I'm like, unbelievable. Like just, she was actually like, you could tell she was held in such a high regard from anyone she played with or against and like to hear some of the guys tell stories about her about like she she could have played like this wasn't like a publicity stunt this is the 90s like there's no twitter there's no Mm -hmm. this isn't shoved in your face like this was like a legitimate she's good enough to be here type thing and like that was just unbelievable to see like if you want to talk about you know empowering women i think that's such a powerful story of going like you know, this stuff has been possible. She proved she could do it back in a day where it was like, you had to be a tough, tough man, like smoke cigarettes in between periods <laughs> type thing. Like, and she did it in that era. And I, I just, yeah, I thought that was super impressive because I couldn't even imagine being like a guy going to play volleyball. Like girls would yeah. destroy me. Yeah. So it's like everyone talks about, oh, like a girl playing a sport. It's like, these guys saying that you put them on the ice they're they're not any better no. it's just like no. if you don't play the sport you have no you know perception of what it really is and just for a girl especially being a goalie yeah. and stopping 100 mile hour, mile per hour shots she must be nuts a little bit yeah. but yeah. very talented <laughs> yeah i think i think when i listened to that interview she was saying that her was she saying that her brothers threw her in the net because doesn't she have brothers right so we've talked to a couple of other female goalies um Mm -hmm. and they were all a couple of them have all said that they ended up in goal because they had older brothers who played and they needed somebody in net and that's like kind of how they ended up there so it's It's so uh, weird yeah yeah, my brother did that to me right i I have a younger brother goalie right (laughs) <laughs> but I don't I don't get it because I used to torture that poor kid. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, like he's like so it's funny, especially when you add the element that so like my and he's my brother through and through. Might not be blood, but I have an adopted brother. And um so we adopted him from Columbia when he was seven years old. And before he turned eight, I had him in net and he like he couldn't even speak English, but he could you know, stop a tennis ball if I shot it at him. But I was like, you know, I was 15, like right. about to go to the OHL. So like I was already a pretty good hockey player. My shot was hard. 
And this little psychopath would go stand in net with goalie pads, not knowing <laughs> even how to tell me to stop. And like, I would like, you know, if he made a save and got cocky and like celebrated, I'd be like, little fucker. And I'd shoot the next one, hit him right in the chest. And then he'd cry, go run it in the house. So like the fact that he ended up actually being a goalie, I'm like, you enjoyed that? Like, right. yeah. yeah. So I honestly, I think it's like that family element though, of that's like, at a young age, you like relate that to hanging out with your family or your brother and you want that to continue. Right. So you're like, right. fine, I'll play goalie. I'll play goal. And then it just becomes your thing. And I think that's how it goes. Yeah. And I'm sure like he wants to, maybe not, but like he, you're his like new family. So he wants to bond with you and like adapt and learn. And so he's like, what from Columbia? Like, I'm sure he's like, what is all of this crazy stuff that this brother that I can't even talk to is making me put on? And what <laughs> is this? Like, what is this crazy sport? I know it was, <laughs> it was funny. Like just, yeah, that whole thing, it was kind of just like wild, like even remove the hockey aspect of just like that whole when he first came over like it was just such a weird dynamic of like right. I can't you know even conversate with him like so we went from like I think like I'll never forget like the coolest part was like when my mom got back uh with him from Columbia obviously she told him all about me and all this stuff while she was with him for a couple of weeks and then uh we went to pick them up at the airport like the second he saw me, like ran up to me, gave me a hug. And I was like, all right, like, all right. I, I love him. Fine. I guess I'll keep him. <laughs> but, uh, but then, you know, a week later while we're already hanging out, doing all this stuff, like we can't communicate. Like I said, well, he knew how to com communicate with me in one way, which is when he was not happy with me for the first time. And it blew my mind because I was speechless, but he goes, <laughs> room because so I was like I can't yell at him I can't beat him up I was like I can't even I don't know how to tell him what that actually means and why I'm that mad but I was like I remember walking out of the room going this little mother like I he can't flip me the me. bird yeah like how does he know that <laughs> yeah. so universal the middle finger is yes it is mm -hmm. did you ever talk to him like now that you're older like ask him like what did you think about think like so. me no. making you play hockey and be a goalie uh oh okay well that yes i middle finger though i'm gonna have to, i might have to call him after this like how how'd you know that like yeah. back then <laughs> you know, i'm curious the origins of that finger but um uh, but the hockey yeah, part no, yeah no and we've uh we've talked about it like like i said it's he just enjoyed it after a little while you know it's i don't think at first when i'm just firing pucks at him he really liked it <laughs> but i think he ended up obviously seeing the way hockey was played and that became an initial interest because of mm -hmm. course he had to come to my games all the time my parents would bring him we were always watching red wings games stuff like that so like he ended up uh realizing dominic Kosick. so he knew goalie he didn't have to know the language but he recognized the red post he stood between and the guy getting hit with all the pucks and it's like so that yeah that was his position he was like hey i, I was just doing that and Basically, that was it. And then, yeah, Dominic Kosick, obviously a Hall of Fame goalie, too. And so when he was in Detroit, made it really easy for him to have an idol to start looking up to. So yeah. he wore 39 and played in between the pipes. Cool. You know, I yeah. think that's true with younger siblings. I have a younger brother and we're six, six years apart. And so I played all the like sports growing up, except for hockey. Um, and so he was always playing against me and our neighbor was my age. So he was this like little four-year-old trying to shoot baskets against somebody you know, twice his height. And I think it made, honestly, my brother was a far better athlete, like all around than me or my <laughs> guy neighbor that we grew up playing against because he was so much younger and ha like was so like competitive and we didn't let up on him because we were- You had to learn a different way to win. Yeah, and he did. Yeah. And I think it makes us a different player and they have to look at the game, whatever game they're playing. Um, from a different yeah. perspective so there's yeah, truth like to it. adversity introduced early in your life I think it is it's like you're put in that tough position right away and like I I didn't have 
I don't have an older sibling. So like I had a little bit of that instilled with me. I had a, my best friend growing up was a kid who lived two doors down and he was two years older than me. Mm-hmm. And same thing. Like yeah. I, I, fortunately I was a better athlete a little bit <laughs> just more of a more of a man's man than he was we'll just say but uh you know I did realize there were some things he could do that I couldn't or like mm-hmm. just that little bit of an age gap it's right like you can't do anything when you're growing up someone's gonna two years older than you is gonna be a little bit bigger and so yeah I had to uh, you know learn how to do things a different way too especially when it came to hockey so uh you know if we played hockey all the time and Fortunately, uh, I caught up to him and surpassed him a little bit quicker than I thought I would. But you know, it was it paid a, off in the long run. He helped you. me out. Hey, yeah. with him, I might not be where I am, so I have to give him credit. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, our last question <laughs> is: um, since you're a fellow Sid, I think you might like this. Uh, do you have a Sidney Crosby story? I uh, I have. I, well, I guess you'd call it a story, but it's more just of what years were they? It was 2000, yeah, 2008, 2009. So there had been like the Red Wings won in 08, Penguins won in 09. Crosby just got into the league, obviously. So it became the Red Wings Penguins rivalry. And I, I don't think, and probably to this day, at, right now, the most hated person in Detroit might still be Sidney Crosby like as far as like athlete on another team so like when obviously if he's not on your team you don't like him and that just it goes to show how good Crosby is that people hate him that intensely and pick (laughs) pick every single thing he does Mm -hmm. and like they just have to so like this guy they know how good he is so like I have to make him seem bad some way so I, I remember back in the day, like everyone, oh, he's such a whiner. He's such a baby. He's this and that. And I'm like, yeah, you guys have no clue what you're talking about. Like <laughs> this is an 18 year old who's right. supposed to be the best player in the NHL, who's getting the shit kicked out of him every single night, but he gets back up. He keeps, and he keeps scoring like all this stuff. So I was like, you guys keep saying all this stuff. And I go, if I was the most highly touted player in the NHL, I'd probably go wind to the refs a little bit more too because that's going to benefit me and my team yeah i'm trying to win so i don't care like as long as it's in between the rules of the game or in between the lines why wouldn't you try to use it mm-hmm. like and sure. i'm i kind of do the same like i don't wind the refs but i i've always like found you talk to refs like a human being because they are and you don't yell at them about everything you might give them shit here and there but Sometimes you just go, you know, all right, that was a bad one. Or you just like say it with zero tone in your voice and they end up calling less penalties on you or someone will get, you know, a penalty for whatever they do to you a lot easier than they would someone else necessarily. So like, don't let them know I've been playing this mind game for years. (laughs) You won't tell them. It's uh, it's the secret sauce, if you will. And sauce is forever. So Sauce is forever. (laughs) We've got to end it there. Yes. Tell so, that's the Crosby. Everyone, everyone just hated him in Detroit. And it, I'm pretty sure it's still around today. Okay. Tell everybody yeah. where they can um, follow you on social media, if you're active anywhere. And um, when, when are you guys hoping the season's going to start so people can uh, check out the games are, online? Is it going to be streamed? Like where do people watch the games? Yeah, so while well, social media, if, as long as you can spell my last name, uh, it's Sidlowski19, basically everything. So at Sidlowski19 on Twitter and Instagram. Um, so for that, and then uh, our season, our first game, uh, we open up on the road um, in Wheeling, I believe it is, but we play February 12th. Um, so we play there two games that weekend, and then we come home and have our home opener which would be on the 18th I believe um so that's uh basically when it gets going and then yeah for anyone who can't get into the games uh, I believe we still I believe it's still echl.tv that the games stream on so uh you know they have single game packages monthly yearly all that type of stuff so uh yeah you can find us one way or another but hopefully uh soon enough we'll be able to get uh, back to 100 percent capacity and instead of this 25.
Thanks for coming over to our House of Hockey podcast and hanging out with us. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on social media. Just look for House of Hockey podcast. We'll be back next week.